Welcome to Urban Dharma, the podcast, where suffering is optional. Hi, this is Revan Kusla coming to you from downtown Los Angeles, from the International Buddhist Meditation Center in the heart of Koreatown. It's a sunny and cool January day here in Los Angeles, and what you're about to hear is Class 3, Part 2 of an extension class I taught at Loyola Marymount University. The extension class was titled Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. This was a four-week class that went from September 28th to October 19th, 2006. More than anything else, it was uh, an overview of the Buddhist path, as well as an introduction to a Buddhist way of life. So, Class 3, Part 2, Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. What we need to do is we need to figure out if we're going to count the in-breaths, the out-breaths, or both. And you can't change. There's no changing. you got to stick with it. Well, you can change tomorrow if you want, but, but in these few minutes we're going to be meditating, we've got to stick with either the in-breath, the out-breath, or both. And we're going to count, and we're going to go from 1 to 10 and 10 to 1. 1 to 10 and 10 to 1. Now, if you go to zero, that means you weren't paying attention, and you have to go back to one. And if you go to 11, that means you weren't paying attention, and you have to go back to one. And if you have a thought, like, why the heck am I doing this, uh, and can't remember what the next number was, then you have to go back to one. So sometimes beginning meditation is called going back to one because you never make it to 10. And that's okay. The idea is we're not, there's nothing to accomplish here other than meditating. And you will know you're meditating if you're counting your breath. If you're doing anything else, you're not meditating. So it's a real easy way to decide if you're meditating. When you get into following the sensation of breath, it's more difficult because sometimes fantasies arise and you're swept away to a desert island and it's a wonderful breeze and, and then you, you know, then oh, I'm meditating. So sometimes it's difficult to know if you're meditating if you don't have any mind involved. But we're going to be counting 1 to 10, 10 to 1, 1 to 10, 10 to 1. And what I'll do is I'll ring the bell three times and rather than having music we'll do the loving kindness meditation like we did last week and then I'll stop doing the loving kindness meditation and we'll just we'll just follow our breath one to ten ten to one having already decided whether it's the in breath the out breath or both then at a certain point 10 15 minutes into the process I'll start again with the loving kindness meditation and that will be the cue that we're now coming out of that counting and, and coming back. Sometimes you get very relaxed, sometimes you get a little sleepy. It's okay, you can still count your breath and be a little sleepy. Sometimes you might be agitated, you can still count your breath and be agitated. You might find that your thought process is still continuing to rattle on, discursive thought is still happening. If that's the case, just think of it as being the radio in the back of the room that somebody forgot to turn off. You can still count your breath and have the discursive thought going on inside your head. Now, if you hear voices in somebody else's head, then, then you got it. <laughs> okay, any questions? Okay, does it make sense? Okay. Will you have less, ultimately less breath? Breathe less after a while? Yeah, exactly. The more relaxed you become, it seems the deeper the breath becomes, <laughs> and, fewer and fewer of them, and harder to follow them, okay. because they're becoming more subtle. So it really requires more, even more focus as you continue to meditate, rather than less focus. Are you yeah, well, there's a couple ways to do it. Now, we're sort of, you know, got these little desks here and stuff. And, uh, and um, one of the best ways to sit, if you're going to sit in a chair, and sitting in a chair is fine. You don't need to sit on the ground. Um, what you want to do if you sit in the chair 
is you want to sit on the front of the chair, and you want your leg to make an L, and feet firmly on the floor, and then your hands, it can either be on your knees or can be in your lap, but you want to have your back not being supported if you can. Now, in these chairs, it's really difficult because there's... But, and, and why would that be the case? Because uh, if your back is supported, eventually you start to relax. And then you, you know. And so if, you're, if your back is not pressing against the chair, then you have to find that balance that comes with letting the spine support the body instead of the muscles. And there is a place of balance that you can find where gravity is actually helping you sit straight. Imagine you're standing underneath the waterfall, and the water is coming down. And now you lean a little bit forward, and the water catches your back and just really pushes you really hard. You're standing under the waterfall, and you lean a little bit back, and now the water catches your chest, and you just go flying backwards. But if you're standing straight in the waterfall, the waterfall actually keeps you from either going forward or backward. And gravity can do that once we find the balance. Finding the balance is very difficult because I can't tell you where the balance is. You've got to feel the balance. But it will allow you to sit like this for a long period of time. Now, I have a motorcycle, and I took my motorcycle to Wisconsin and back, 5,000 miles. And for those 5,000 miles, how was I sitting? Just like this. (laughs) And you know what? After a few days... (laughs) It's not bad. <laughs> but you, I couldn't lean, you know, I couldn't, it's very hard to stretch your legs. You just sort of, there you go. And, and meditation is sort of like that. Only instead of us going to Wisconsin, we're going to be journeying inside. We're going to be taking the internal journey rather than the external journey. So meditation has allowed me to really ride well on my motorcycle. My body's calm, my mind is alert, and I have good posture. <laughs> Okay. Any questions? We all sit on this. Okay. Now, if you have to move, you know, don't hate yourself. Be kind and just move. You're not supposed to scratch. Well, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good question. Is, is it okay to scratch? Is it okay to move? And, and the answer, of course. If you have to scratch, if you have to move, it's fine. But what happens if you don't scratch? What can you... What can you learn by not scratching? Well, you can learn uh, one of two things. Either that the scratch will lead to your death, or it'll simply go away. See, the worst case scenario of any sensation is that it will lead to our death. And so we're sitting on the ground, our knees start to hurt, and we move our knees. But, you know, the, the real reason we're moving our knees is because we don't want to die. That's always the ultimate problem with any uncomfortable sensation. It's a signal that death is just around the corner. Now, having sat for many years, I realize that even if my knees do hurt, sitting for 10 or 15 minutes will not permanently injure me. I might walk a little funny for the first couple of steps, but then I'm back to normal. I, I've realized that all those scratches I didn't scratch they eventually went away or went someplace else. So the scratch was here, and now it's up here. And now it's here. So I learned a lot about myself, not simply reacting to it, but instead responding to all those sensations. And if you do scratch, say you're just, you just, you know, you just got to scratch your face. If you do scratch, you want to do it mindfully. And mindful scratching looks like this. You just very slowly, and then you bring it back. And you're really focusing on the movement of your arm and waiting for the fingers to touch your face. How does that feel? And then going back like that. You're just slowing the whole process down. You're investigating what it means to be you instead of just scratching and not even know you scratched. How many times have we done that? Or shifting our position and not even thinking about that. If you have to shift your position, do it mindfully, slowly, purposefully. Learn something every time you move. A 
about yourself. But it's okay to move. We're not masochists here. And in some Zen monasteries, they have the stick that they hit you with if you move. But um, I left the stick at the center. <laughs> so we're okay. So, okay. So have you decided? In breath, out breath, both? Okay, good. Okay, what do you do with your eyes? Good question. If you're going to keep your eyes open, you want to look about, seeing as we're sitting, you want to look about three feet in front of you. And you want to unfocus your eyes. You don't want to look at anything in particular. You just want to sort of let the eyes become unfocused and just sort of take in the whole thing. If you feel that keeping your eyes open will disturb you, then it's okay to close your eyes. That's how I normally do it, because when I find myself sitting with a group of people, they're always moving and scratching, and it disturbs me. So I usually close my eyes. The only time I open my eyes is if I'm really tired, and I let the light in, and that stimulates my brain and sort of wakes me up a little bit, and then I close my eyes again. So you can have your eyes open or closed, but if they're open, try looking about three feet in front of you towards the floor and keep them unfocused. You want to breathe through your nose and keep your mouth closed, and you want to sort of bring your tongue to the palate, to the top of your mouth. And what that allows you to do is swallow without making a big sound, and it keeps your throat lubricated. Because if you're sitting with a lot of people and they're all swallowing, <coughs> you know, it's just amazing, the sounds that come out of our bodies. So we <laughs> so now everybody's going to be swallowing the whole time. <laughs> but if you keep your tongue at the top of your mouth, you'll, you'll swallow less and swallow more silently. Uh, the hands, the back is straight. You want to try to breathe through your diaphragm instead of your lungs. If you're not used to breathing through your diaphragm, try lying on the floor sometime when you're at home and putting a book on your stomach and see if you can make the book go up and down when you breathe. Get an idea of how it feels to breathe with your diaphragm. I found out to playing harmonica. They're relatively cheap if you're interested in learning how to play harmonica, but that's a great way to learn diaphragmic breathing, or for that matter, any wind instrument will help you breathe through your diaphragm. So we've got the posture. We know what to do with our eyes. We know what to do with our mouth. We know how to breathe. We've decided on what we're going to count. Inhale, exhale, and now... We're going to see if we can do it. If you can't do it, if you fall asleep, we'll wake you up. It's okay. Here we go. May those of us who have come together tonight in mind and heart be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May no problems come to us. May we always find fulfillment. May we also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May our teachers and all teachers of the truth be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May our parents, our partners, our brothers and sisters, our friends and relatives, all the people we don't know, all the people we don't like. May they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment. May they also have patience, courage, understanding, 
and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. From the highest realm of existence to the lowest, may all beings arisen in any of these realms, with form and without, with perception and without, with consciousness and without, may they too be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to them. May no difficulties come to them. May no problems come to them. May they always find fulfillment May they also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. May those of us who have come together tonight in mind and heart be happy, peaceful, and free from suffering. May no harm come to us. May no difficulties come to us. May no problems come to us. May we always find fulfillment. May we also have patience, courage, understanding, and determination to meet and overcome the inevitable difficulties, problems, and failures in life. Did anybody succeed in counting to 1 to 10, 10 to 1? Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Could you... <laughs> what was that? Before I started falling asleep. Oh, okay. It was very peaceful. It's, yeah, yeah. You get sort of warm and cozy. You know? Uh, sleep is uh, really seductive. And if you go on long retreats, uh, weekend or week-long retreats, the sleep will come and get you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's just amazing. How did you feel? Did you did you feel, were you, was your mind able to slow down a bit? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Good. I was very peaceful, and in the kind of sort of scary. It was a little bit scary? Mm -hmm. Because? Because it was peaceful? Ah. And your old friend, discursive thought, was in keeping you company? Yeah. It can be uh, very... Uh, well, it, it can be a feeling of uh, insecurity because we're sort of not in charge like we're normally feeling about ourselves. We're sort of letting that aspect go for a while. And we're able to stay focused on the sensation of breath? Did you ever lose it? Okay, and then you just came back to it? Okay. What I was finding is I was just kind of in a trance like that. Yeah. And that kind of made me feel a little weird. So I wrote what you said, too. I think I'm not getting enough oxygen. My mind started, you know, what's wrong here? And then I brought it back. I'm going to die. I'm not, yeah. I opened my eyes because I was kind of focusing. 
Okay. Okay. Uh huh. And then just close my eyes again. And then the reality of the classroom allowed you to, I'm sure it was like an anchor. You know, yeah, yeah. There's something in acting called a stage trance. And if you've ever seen, you know, good actors and actresses, they just sort of like have this look on their face. And it's so wide open and they're not looking at anything. And they're able to, lines come out and they're interacting and it's very fascinating. And there is a trance-like quality um, uh, in this kind of meditation where you pretty much, you know, um, going into a state of one-pointedness where the mind is just sort of going in a circle. One, two, and this, yeah. But that in itself, I think, allows us to really get to that place of relaxation where the past and future starts to fall away. Most of our problems are past and future. And very few problems happening right now. Other than maybe a leg that fell asleep or something. You know. okay. How was your experience? It, uh, it was really good. I okay. Difficulty uh, concentrating and focusing. I must have started over at one 20 times. Okay. But just a couple of times I made it up to 10 and back down to zero. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that interesting how unruly our mind is? Yes. That we give it a simple task, like counting from 1 to 10. Mm -hmm. And it can't do it sometimes. I also had a feeling of lightness. Yes, that's weightlessness. weightlessness. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, that seems to be a little bit of the self starting to um, become more transparent. That, that sense of self is oftentimes like lead, a rock, stable, centering. And, and if, you, if you start to meditate, that, that sense of self starts to become a bit more transparent, and there is a lightness that comes with that. I remember meditating with a, a friend of mine, and, and uh, she was sitting next to me at the Zendo. And after the, the gong rang, she said, did you see? Did you see? And I said, what? She said, I was floating. I was off the floor. And, and for me, what that meant was that her sense of self was floating. It wasn't that rock-solid thing that she was so used to being with. So it's a very pleasant, and it can be exactly the opposite, too. You can weigh 10,000 pounds, and you just the weight of the world is just like you can't move an inch. You know, or even a quarter of an inch. So I find that to be very relaxing. And initially, I, I too was a bit nervous. Even in the beginning stages, do you have some of these experiences, and you're not quite sure what they mean, uh, if it's right to have them? Uh, do other humans have these experiences? Am I the only one? Uh, and and after they occur a, a, a few times, you sort of get used to them. And sometimes don't even notice them anymore. They become just what sort of happens. Yeah. How was your experience? Um, it was wonderful. Uh, I like this me method. Yeah. I started uh, last February. I started meditating. Did you? Yeah, in Conyers, Georgia. With okay. some Trappist one. Okay. And uh, it was wonderful, but overwhelming. And now it's very simple. Very simple. I don't have to worry about anything. Yeah. You don't even have to worry about breathing. It does itself. I'm not expecting anything. Not expecting anything. Good. Well, I'm, I'm happy that was the case. Sometimes meditation can be very complicated. If you have to remember a lot of things. <laughs> and, 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 and that sort of goes, for me, that sort of counter counters everything that that's good about meditation. I'm glad you found it a, uh, a pleasant experience. Do you think you can do it every day? Mm -hmm. I've been doing it. Uh, I've been practicing meditation. Ha have you been doing it every day since February? Since February? Yes. Wow. And, uh, I think uh, I like this method. Good. It's very simple. Yes. And, and proven to be a good one. 2,700 years have gone into... 
working out this method. So how was your meditation? It was very good. Good. I didn't lose track of the numbers. I think that number thing is just a great, well, I don't want to say trick, but... A tool. tool. It's a great tool. That's a... And uh, <laughs> I'm very fidgety, usually, also, and I felt, I didn't feel the urge to move. Really? Which was amazing. Okay. I was very worried that I would be distracting other people or coughing or crossing my legs. But none of that happened. No. Wow. Very positive. Oh, that's good. Very positive. Good. And was it good for you, too? It was good. I, uh, Were you able to count I, 1 to 10, 10 to 1? Well, I, yeah, I was able to do that, especially in the very beginning. Okay. And then I really started to relax. <laughs> and uh, it was very good. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it was like I was going to sleep, and then I wake up and go back to one. And uh, okay. that's something that doesn't happen to me when I'm doing it in the morning. In the morning, I don't go to sleep. Mm-hmm. I usually meditate in the morning, and, uh, and I'll, I'm able to stay awake. Um, but I don't meditate with my eyes closed. I, I meditate with my eyes open, and so it's more okay. mindfulness, I think, than it is. I think so. Do you think you could count in your dreams? Continue counting as you went into a dream state? Yes, no. Okay. So rather than just um, say, gosh, I'm dreaming again, and then maybe you could continue to count to really use, you know, to exercise that concentration to the point where you could stay with the numbers, whether you're conscious or... Or even coming to Yeah. 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 The, the, the brain really likes, you know, the brain likes that because it gives a challenge, you know. And then maybe you could start multiplying and dividing too. But, but, but the deal is, uh, the deal is, you want to keep it so simple, so simple, that that the mind is going to sort of get bored easily. And then it requires you to keep, to sort of force the mind back to counting. Even when it says, well, let's go to 100 now, because you're really good at going to 10. And, <laughs> and then, you know, and then you say uh, 9, 8. And it's, so you, you want to go to 100, but, you, but your inner voice says 9, 8, 7, and you just keep going. That's not goals anymore. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to get fancy. Fancy. Yeah. So the mind's a rascal. The mind will not let you do what you want to do because it's been doing it all your whole life. It's been in charge your whole life. Yeah. And it knows best. Yeah. <laughs> and it does, it does, when you're doing just the one to ten, it does force you to be quite simple. And then I found that, um, that there, there would be like a sensation of light, not light of being light. And, and like inner light. light. Inner light, yes. Light, yes. Yeah. yes. Good. Good. Light's good. Light's good. That's a positive energy. If it's darkness, uh, then you need to open your eyes. If you're going into the dark, and if it starts to get silent, and it starts to seem like a, a well of some kind, then you need to open your eyes, uh, because you're going into a place you don't want to go to. But as long as there's a lightness, whether it be physical or actual light, that's good. That's really uh, positive, wholesome energy. That, in, in some cases, is actually the foundation of who we are. It was sort of like this energy thing happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. So yeah. So and and when that happens, you just the only thing you're going to do is keep counting. See, counting is like your lifeline. You know these people that go 300 feet below the water and 500 feet, and they have this whole line. And sometimes they have weights, and they just and then they, you know, stay down there for five minutes, and they start to come up again. Well, no matter what happens, your refuge is your counting. Whether you're, it's light or it's dark, or your body weighs a thousand pounds or a thousand ounces, you just keep counting.
You just stay so focused. So those things can come from them. Those things come. They just happen. They just happen. It's just an experience. They have absolutely no value at all. They. You don't oh no, you you notice them and then you just keep counting. <laughs> And they have no value in the sense that um, that when you concentrate, those things happen. You are not doing it. It is not something special. You have created the conditions for that to happen. You have created the conditions for that to happen. It has nothing to do with you. And if you ever want to re-experience it again in exactly the same way, you will always fail. We can never create the same conditions twice in that way. And I can tell you from personal experience that there were a few things I wanted to re-experience and never got even close to again. And I tried to just build it, just like I, I remembered exactly what I was doing. I tried to build it up. So that stuff just happens. And that can be distraction. And we can think we're gaining something. And we're special. And it's just because we're meditating. That that's happening and when you don't meditate that doesn't happen and so we just keep counting through all that stuff through the blizzard and the rain and the summer and the fall we just keep counting and counting and our little journey our little vehicle takes us through all this terrain and it's wonderful it's amazing what's inside of us and what is the black hole? well the black hole is sort of like that part in our consciousness where um, there is no life, where you just, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, nihilistic, if you will. It's actually sort of like nothing, but not emptiness. It's not emptiness in Buddhism, it's just sort of like nothing. And it, it will uh, steal your energy. You know how the black hole steals light? in the universe, you know, and it, 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 and like it, so it just goes, that's why it's the black hole. So you want to, so if that starts to happen, then you just simply start counting and resurface, you know, come back to the light of the room. That's the good place. So light is a good thing. And, and if we're, if we get used to going after the light, finding the light, uh, that's the same kind of stuff we want to do when we die. As we're going through the death process, we're going after the light. Don't want to go after the darkness. Very interesting. Last but not least, how was your experience? It was good. Did you? Yeah. Did you just get involved in, in the in the present moment experience of comfort and relaxation? Yeah. Okay. And there were other random thoughts. Yep. And were you able to continue to count and still be aware of the thoughts? And it didn't interfere with the counting at all. It's just thoughts were happening. Okay. Yeah, no, but yeah. And so one of the insights I got when I became aware of the thoughts and still could, still could count is that the thoughts were just happening, that I wasn't the thinker, that they were just happening because I have a brain and consciousness and experiences and past and future and all that kind of stuff. So it's actually a very liberating insight to still be able to count, to still be able to have that attention, be in control right. of that attention. It's nice when they don't take over. Well, and of course, that's sort of one of our goals in this goalless practice is to be able to have thoughts and, and simply be aware of them and let them exist and die on their own accord without having to react to them. And, and of course, best case scenario, you know, uh, you're angry. Something's wrong. And that person you're angry at comes into the room. And now you're filled with anger. But do you have to respond or react to them in an angry way? And if you see how your thoughts work, then you more than likely won't be surprised that your first intention is to react with anger. But if you can relax into that and let that intention pass, because as we meditate, we see that everything that 
is born, exists for a while, and then dies. Nothing stays forever. And consciousness is very rapid. So sometimes we can have many, many thoughts in just a very short period of time. And none of those thoughts have to be us. And for once in our life, we have the opportunity to be free. Free from who we think we are or who we think we need to be. We can be free. But it requires discipline and focus to be free. So that's what I noticed when I didn't have to be the thoughts. I thought that was so cool. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Like one of my Mm-hmm. And I can just do that. I don't. There's no other thoughts because it's like one, or two, you know. What I mean? Yeah. So, but if I'm just laying there, tons of thoughts tons of, can I definitely get distracted by them? You know, yeah. Like that for you know a couple of seconds. And this time it didn't. I didn't, I didn't stop to think about it. To check them out. Yeah. Yeah. Investigate them. Yeah. 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 Maybe even participate in them make them bigger and better. Mm-hmm. That's what I sometimes do. <laughs> you know. Very cool. Okay, well, if you feel like doing any homework, why don't you see if you can meditate just a few minutes a day until the next class. You know, pick a time in the morning. Morning is good because we're most awake and have the fewest amount of thoughts. Yeah, right. You know, and then the evening yeah, is... Buzz. Yeah, cause, because, because the dream consciousness, the dream thoughts are different than the waking thoughts. And, and so I, I find that once I wake up, uh, the dreams fall away pretty quickly. And there's this wonderful quiet that allows me to get like a lot of work done on the computer in the morning. And uh, uh, at night, it's the most difficult because the whole day, the experiences of the day have all stacked up, ready to be deciphered, you know. <laughs> what does it all mean? Uh, what I tried to do in my own practice is to have a morning practice and an evening practice. And I tried to have like bookends on my day, a way to start the day and a way to end the day. And, and I, I started with uh, 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening and eventually got to 45 minutes in the morning and 45 minutes in the evening, which is pretty much uh, all the longest you really need to meditate. Some people can meditate for like an hour and a half. But they say, the experts say, that 45 minutes is probably long enough to do what you're going to do in your meditation practice. So, so mine now is about 45 minutes in the morning, 45 minutes in the evening, which isn't, sounds like a lot, but, it's, you know, but after 20 years, you figure 45 minutes, you know, that's not that big a deal. And then on Friday nights at our center, we have meditation from 7.30 into 9, and we have like 20 minutes, 5-minute break, 20 minutes, 5-minute break, 20 minutes, 5-minute break and do loving kindness. And, and that sometimes people, you know, take the break and sometimes they don't. And that gives you a chance to sort of stretch your legs, if you will, and see if you can sit longer than 20 minutes. And if you're sitting with other people, they can be um, um, a good incentive. Because if they're not moving and you're the only one that is, then you might want to sort of not move just to be part of the pack, you know. How long did we, uh, from beginning to end, that was 20 minutes. Really? That was exactly. Really? That was 20 minutes with the loving kindness and the sitting quietly. Oh, that was 20 minutes. Idea that it was half that. You know, so either it's going to be really long or not very long at all. You, you got two ways to go. You know, and like you said, when you heard the cars, those 20 minutes were forever. Yeah. Forever. So sometimes it turns out to be forever, but tonight it seemed to go by pretty quickly. You know, so that's nice when it happens. And what does that mean? That means that time doesn't really exist. And we're and we're slaves to time. What time? What time? What time? I got twenty minutes. How does twenty minutes feel? Well, sometimes if you're late, it feels pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> and sometimes if you're early, twenty minutes seems like a really long time. <laughs> So it's all in our mind. Time is something we made up 
to keep track of change. Time is what we use to measure change. So and, Einstein was right. And what's that? Einstein. <coughs> Einstein was right. Did he say that too? Okay, I, I haven't read the theory of relativity, <laughs> but I, I have looked at my own internal clock, and it just runs at all different paces and times. But yeah, so so we use time to measure change, and and some things change on a regular basis, like days and years and months, and some things change sort of sporadically, and and if we um, if we come to that timeless place, we can sit for a very long time and not feel it, which is also liberating as well. I mean, how long does an hour feel when you're focused on something you really like to do? Like you're in this great movie and there's a car chase scene and, and it's just you're just so into it and your foot is stuck to the ground because somebody dropped a Coke in the previous feature and your arm fell asleep because it's over the back of the seat and you have no clue that all that stuff's happening because you're just looking at the scenes. And it's over, and you go, wow, that was a fast movie. It was only an hour and a half. <laughs> you know? So it's just amazing. When we use our power of concentration, how we can change our reality. And with that, our reality says that it's time for us to, to leave. Thank you for keeping me company tonight. And uh, next week, we'll do more of the same and add some stuff. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's it. That was class three, part two of an extension class I taught at Loyola Marymount University titled Integrating Buddhist Practices into Everyday Life. Hope you found it interesting. Hope you found it useful. We have two more parts to go, and that finishes the series. If you'd like to know more about me, please visit my website, kusala.info. That's kusala.info. If you'd like to hear more Dharma Talks or interviews I've done, you can visit dharmatalks.info. That's dharmatalks.info. If you'd like to download some free ebooks on Buddhism and a 2007 Buddhist calendar in PDF suitable for printing, please visit buddhabooks.info. That's buddhabooks.info. Dot info. And if you'd like to email me, my email address is kusala at urbandharma.org and I'll get back with you just as soon as I can. Well, until the next time, until the next podcast, be happy, be peaceful, and most of all, be free from suffering. <laughs>